Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today we're going to take a look at yet another newly made Commodore 64 mainboard. And this one is quite special compared to the other options that there are for new Commodore 64 boards and I'm super excited to try this out. So let's have a look. So this is what I got. A nice letter to Jan Beta and team. I wish. This is the Evo 64 board and the team, Dr. Stefano, Daryl and Mario, were kind enough to send me one to take a look at. Uh, this is a pre-production version of this. I think they still made some minor changes uh, compared to the production version that is available for pre-ordering or reservations at least at this point in time. I'm going to link that in the video description in case you're interested. So thank you very very much for letting me take a look at this. I am super excited about this uh, because there can never be too many Commodore 64 reiterations in my opinion because the C64 is just a lovely system as you probably know if you're watching this video. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually not a huge fan of unboxing videos, so I'm going to keep this uh, short and painless. Yay, there it is. Super nice uh, anti-static wrap here. That's cool. This very closely resembles the common Commodore 64 boards. That's because it is based on the original boards, but as you can see, there have been some modernizations going on. The most obvious being that there's surface mount parts for the smaller parts. There's no separate dual inline package RAM chips and there are all surface mount capacitors here. There are only very few through hole parts, the connectors and uh, this voltage regulator and the power switch and the rectifier and these sockets are also still through hole because you need to put the original MOS chips in here or replacements for those. We're going to take a look at that in a second. So what is this and why did this come about? Uh, the thing is that this is actually based on the original Commodore 64 boards as I've said. This started out with the reverse engineered version that BWAC Hans did a while back of the 250407 classic longboard Commodore 64 that he open sourced and you can still download the files for that and have the CAD files and tinker with those. And that's what Dr. Stefano actually did. And there were some incarnations of this that were merely replicas of the 407 boards that had some additional functionality. And then it evolved, hence the name Evo, I guess, <laughs> into this, which has quite a few add-ons that you could also get separately integrated nicely into this uh, board design. So uh, that is a pretty neat idea. And that is also what's the new thing about this. So this incorporates several mods that you could get as plugins previously, literal plugins, physical plugins. So uh, let's take a look at those. So the things that have been added to this, apart from uh, most of the smaller parts being replaced by modern parts, are in this area here where the WIC2 graphics chip goes, just like on your regular Commodore 64 boards, plugs in here, we have the Clear Video 64, which is actually based on the circuit by J. Des Murray that I took a look at in a previous video a while back, a couple of years, I think, that is integrated here in the board. That's pretty neat. And also another thing that I took a look at in another video when I built my Commodore 64 based off the 60 clone board, which is a one-to-one -one replica of the Commodore 64 original board. I used Jeff Bird's replacement for the clock chip, which this clock generator circuit is based on. So they integrated that. You don't need the 8701 MOS clock chip that is 
pretty prone to failure actually, so you don't need that ship any longer. The VIC-2 can be replaced with the newly available Kavari chip that is said to be fully compatible with this board. And it also is compatible with original VIC-2 chips, obviously. Then we have over here for the sound. That's something we are going to get into a bit more. We have two SID sockets for the SID sound chip. And you can actually use uh, SID replacements in here. You can use original SIDs of uh, all variants that are available. You have to set these little jumpers accordingly, but they are nicely labeled. So probably if you know what you're doing a bit, not much can go wrong with this. The dual SID setup is a derivative of Henning Liebenau's uh, dual SID circuit board, actually, that you could add on to your existing Commodore 64 setup that's also integrated on the board, which is super nice. Then we have this here, which is already equipped with an EEPROM. This is a multi-kernel add-on. So you have one EEPROM here that has a lot of different kernels, a lot of different character ROMs and also software can be stored on here, which is super neat. This is a super versatile thing. And we also have the Kapla, which is derived from several PLA replacements that are already available. They used a little CPLD here to replace the old PLA of the Commodore 64 that was pretty prone to failure as well. So another chip that you don't need anymore. And also they replaced all the RAM with, I think this one, this is a RAM chip. So this thing is based on a lot of things that we've seen previously, all nicely integrated into one board. So you don't have to go through the trouble of plugging everything in. Connections can be bad, things like that. Uh, this is all nicely integrated in this board. So you don't have to worry about anything in that regard. The thing that makes this unique and sets this apart from other C64 replica boards is this portion of the board though. This is the new tube 64, which is a preamp that uses the Korg new tube technology to provide an audio output that is unmatched in any C64 so far. So uh, apart from this having all the dual SID settings you could ever want in a C64, this also has options for quite some nice preamps. One of them being the new tube 64 that I got provided here. You can also just leave that out and have a regular dual SID setup going out your uh, AV jack here. But there's options for the new tube and there's also an option for tubes. Actual vacuum tube preamp in your Commodore 64, which is kind of amazing and also totally over the top and uh, kind of insane, but I love it. We're going to take a look or a listen to the extended sound capabilities that this probably has with this uh, kind of circuit in there in a bit. Let me show you how to set this up in the first place. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs. They also do CNC machining, 3D printing and things like that. You can send them your files you designed at home and they are going to make the products in no time and deliver them straight to your door. The prices are super reasonable, they are super fun to work with and I highly recommend them. So check out the link in the video description. Back to the EVO 64. So we obviously have to populate these sockets before we can use this. And we actually are not at the point where we can replace all of these chips, the original custom MOS chips from the Commodore 64 with completely new ones, but we are getting closer. The CIA chips that go in these positions, the input output chips basically are still not available as replicas. There is someone working on them, it seems, but there were no updates to that website in two or three years, I think, at this point. So time will tell if they are ever going to see the light of day. 
There are a number of replacements for the 6510, which is the CPU for the C64. There are adapters to use modern 6502 chips. There are also other options that kind of emulate the 6510. They are all kind of in pre-production stages. You can get these adapters already, but yeah, basically there's no plug and play replacement for that yet. It's kind of still in the works to an extent. We have replacements for the SID chip, which are very good at this point in time. The ARM SID I have talked about extensively. And there's also things like the Nano Swin SID, the FPGA SID, the back SID that Eevee makes that we're going to take a look at in another video. Yeah, there are several options for these. There's also the VIC-2 Kavari, which I have taken a look at at a prototype in a previous video, which is a replacement for the VIC-2 graphics chip. Long story short, what I'm going to do is to use standard MOS parts for this build because I really want to hear the real sits and really want to try to keep this as close to an original C64 from its uh, circuitry as possible, basically. This is a board that has some upgrades, but it's still basically the same architecture as the original Commodore 64, so it should be 100% compatible to all the C64 software, which is kind of the intention of this board. And the other huge intention, I think, is the audio output. Another thing that they added is uh, ESD protection on the joystick ports. A common thing that would happen to many Commodore 64s was that uh, if you touched the joystick ports accidentally or if you were not paying attention, something like that, you could easily send electrostatical discharge from your body directly to the CAA chips, which uh, these joystick ports are more or less directly connected to and fry those chips in the worst case. That was a common cause for CAA chips to fail on the Commodore 64. And there's little diodes, uh, diode packs actually here that prevent that from happening, which is a nice addition. So uh, let's take a look at the back side of the board. There's some stuff on here actually that is not present on the original boards, obviously, because this is uh, converted to surface mounted. They have a lot of the small capacitors are actually placed on the bottom of the board, which is kind of amazing. Uh, it makes the whole thing look a lot neater than the original designs, a lot more modern in a sensitive way, kind of. Uh, so the modernizations are kind of minimal, but they used all modern uh, small components, which is kind of amazing that they pulled that off while still keeping this the same form factor and the same connections and things like that, like the original Commodore 64s. The thing that came closest to this new Evolution Commodore 64 is the Commodore 64 Reloaded Mark II, which we have here made by individual computers. I think it's still readily available to buy. That uses a similar approach in that it uses uh, mostly surface mount components and has these sockets for the original Commodore chips. So it is a similar approach to what the Evo 64 team did in that it modernizes the Commodore 64 architecture in a way that it is still the original architecture just with more modern parts. This is pretty similar. They use the same RAM in here, basically. This has some other quirks. This is very plug and play, no jumper settings to set on the Mark II C64 Reloaded. So this is a bit smarter in a way. So you can plug in chips and it's going to auto configure to the voltages the chips need and things like that. Uh, whereas you have to set some jumpers on this. Uh, this doesn't include the preamp stuff, obviously. It also has dual SID sockets. The Reloaded is mostly based on the uh, later C64 boards, the 25469 revisions. 
This is based mostly on the 250407 revision and then it includes some quirks of the 469. So this uh, also has a slightly different form factor because this is the form factor of the shorter, more recent original Commodore 64 boards. And this is the footprint of the larger long board revisions of the C64, so the more classic versions of that. Yeah, what I'm going to do is to basically uh, place the chips from this board into this board and see if we can make this work in the first place. That should be an easy task because they provided these nice sockets that I didn't see anywhere else yet. The ones on the reloaded are zero insertion force sockets and these are kind of flat versions of those which are super nice they feel quite good actually yeah so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to place the chips from the reloaded that i have tested out a bit but didn't make a video about yet there is probably going to be a video about that board as well i like that quite a lot but i didn't find the time to make an in-depth video about that and this is a new product, so we're going to take a look at this and use the chips from this, because I'm actually running out of Commodore MOS replacement chips. <laughs> Can you believe it? One key difference between the two is that the power supply section on the Reloaded is completely different to what's present on the EVO board. Uh, this uses a single 12 volt DC power supply and derives all the necessary voltages from that, whereas the EVO uses more of the traditional route. That's why there's these huge capacitors and all the filtering and a bridge rectifier in here. This power supply section is basically the same as on the old longboards. And they did that, I think, for the reason that the original power supply section produces cleaner output voltages. So they're using linear regulators here instead of the switching regulator they used on the reloaded board just to keep the voltages as clean as possible for the best possible audio output that's i think is the reason for that so uh, without further ado i'm just going to place the chips from the reloaded board in the evil board which should be an easy task given that it's all zero insertion force sockets here. All these chips should be okay. I tested the reloaded with those, so hope these work. So we're going to have one classic 6581, which this is, and we're going to put a 8580, which is the later revision of the SID chip into this socket. This is going to be our primary SID and this is going to be our secondary SID and we're going to go into that very deeply in a bit. So uh, we're going to have to set some jumpers here. So we don't need to change any jumper settings for the CAA chips and the processor. These are all interchangeable basically. They use the same input voltages on all revisions so these can be plugged in any c64 including the evo board here we're going to have to pay a bit more attention to this setup here with the vic2 and the sit chips so for the sit chips we want to set these to the supply voltage that they actually need uh, this is an 8580 that uses a 9 volt supply voltage that's also printed on the board here, 6581 uses 12 volts. We have to jumper this to 12 volts and we have to jumper this to 9 volts. I'm going to use my tweezers here. There we go. So this is now going to get 12 volts where it needs the 12 volts. Uh, you don't want to send 12 volts to an 8580. That's going to work for a short period of time and then burn out probably. Whereas the 6581 do work with the 9 volt supply, but it's better to provide them with the voltage that they actually need. I'm not sure if they can be damaged by getting too low of a voltage, but yeah, I wouldn't bet that they take that well. So we are going to jump for this 
accordingly. So we need to jumper this to the capacitors. Uh, they actually use different capacitors on the audio output for both revisions. So uh, we are going to have to put both of these jumpers into open for the 6581 actually, which is what we're going to do. And the 8580 needs both of these closed. It's also all written on the silk screen, thankfully. So that makes things significantly easier. Same for the VIC-2. We need to supply that with the correct voltages according to the revision of the VIC-2, which in this case is a newer VIC-2 that uh, usually goes on the short board revisions that uses five volts supply as is laid out here on the board. The older uh, VIC-2 chips 65, 69 and 65, 67, PAL and NTSC respectively, uh, use a 12 volt supply additionally to a 5 volt supply. Similar to the SID chip, we want to set this to PAL because this is a PAL version of the chip. You can just switch these jumpers. Both crystals for PAL and NTSC are present on the board, so you can use this with PAL and NTSC VIC-2 chips that also provide the timings for the rest of the system. So you can basically just switch this between NTSC and PAL if you have the correct VIC-2 in there. Or a Kavari which can do both. So that's pretty nice. Yeah, we're going to leave this as a PAL and we're going to leave this voltage supply jumper in the 5 volt position for this newer VIC-2. In theory, this should now be a functioning Commodore 64 or an Evo 64. <laughs> so I have connected my uh, shoddy upscaler here to this monitor and a standard composite cable to the Commodore 64 AV jack. And I have connected my self-made power supply that I made a video about a while back to the Evo board. Now all the chips are in. I double checked if they are in the correct orientation and they should be. All the notches are facing the same way. Thankfully on these, that should be all good. And it should at this point behave like a completely normal Commodore 64 when I turn it on. And indeed, it does. And it has an onboard reset switch here that we can trigger. That also works, no problem. And it has a built-in power LED, which is kind of a nice addition. <laughs> and also, it glows. <laughs> These uh, vacuum fluorescent displays are used to uh, kind of emulate valves in these new tube circuits. So it has a little greenish bluish glow there. Don't know if you can see that well. Basic functionality should be here and we should have a fully functional Commodore 64 system here with a lot of added functionality. So far so good. So fast forward to around a week later uh, with me spending a lot of time with the EVO 64 and checking out some of its capabilities. And I ran some software on it and tried things out for compatibility. And it seems like this is 100% compatible with an original C64. All the demos and things like that, I threw it, it did work flawlessly. So maybe there are some incompatibilities that I couldn't find. Let me know in the comments if you find some incompatibilities with this uh, device, if you decide to get one. I'm pretty sure that this is at least very compatible to an original C64. The dual SID setup especially is kind of amazing with the preamp module that I have installed here. Yeah, we're going to take a closer look at that later. So as you can see, I've tried quite some things here. I hooked up a spare C64 keyboard that I had lying around. I tried to capture the sound via this old school uh, mixer. I did connect a joystick, played some games. I have my 1541 Ultimate hanging off the back there and used that to boot stuff from, which worked flawlessly. Uh, currently I have some little uh, desktop speakers hooked up here 
just to get the whole stereo effect feeling. Currently running this in dual mono sit mode, so both sits are active at the same time playing the same stuff, but they are both different revisions as you've seen. So we get a nice stereo effect from that alone. But there are of course also tunes that are made for dual sits that make use of all the channels on two sits, so uh, three channels plus another three channels on the other sit. I'm going to try to capture that in a bit. I have to say this works beautifully as a replacement C64 board in its own right, but obviously it has some added features that we're going to take a look at now. So obviously we have the clear 64 video circuit here which I have uh, tried to set up, but I didn't spend a lot of time on that. I did a whole video about the kind of standalone version of this. The setup procedures should be pretty much the same. You use these little potentiometers on the board to set different timings and things to get rid of the jail bar stripes that are especially noticeable on these newer VIC-2 chips, the 85 something something versions. So they're not as prominently visible usually on the older 65XX VIC-2s. And even after my very brief setup process, we got rid of most of the jail bars. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, there's barely any jail bars. And usually they are pretty visible, especially if you use modern screens like this or modern -ish screens like this, like flat screens. It works pretty well. As I said, I didn't spend a lot of time on this and still I get a much nicer picture output. So that's definitely a nice feature. Also the timing chip replacement is a super nice feature that allows me to use NTSC or PAL VIC-2 chips. So next up we have the ability to put large EPROMs in here. And you can actually choose the EPROM banks with this row of jumpers, uh, which the EVO 64 people who provided me with this sample unit put a nice little uh, dip switch in. Uh, you can remove this and just solder switches to the board, run them out of your case, things like that. There's footprints for regular jumpers underneath there. This is just plugged in, I think. So we are able to choose from different kernel ROMs, different basic ROMs. We can also run cartridges if we close a jumper here directly from this large ROM. And there's also the possibility of choosing different character ROMs. So this ROM is the only ROM present in the system, which has all the ROMs the Commodore 64 needs combined into one. So a basic ROM, kernel ROM, character ROM are all included. And you can also put cartridge images on here and run them from an EEPROM, which is super nice. So obviously you want to turn the system off while setting these. There's a lot of documentation about these. I'm just changing the character ROM now. This looks like a CPC kind of character set that we have included here. Can also change these around. This looks like the Atari font. And you can of course put your own stuff on the EEPROM. Uh, the first three jumpers are for the character set, I think. And we can set those up in different positions and get different character ROMs. This looks like the Amiga font on the C64. Uh, yeah, endless possibilities basically, as long as you have 8x8 pixel fonts there. And then we have obviously the capability of switching to different kernel ROMs. That's a different ROM, ROM 6. <laughs> This is just example stuff they put on the pre-programmed EEPROM, obviously, with different colors, so you can see the different uh, ROMs being accessed. This is ROM 7. <laughs> and you can just use the dip switches on this one to switch between different versions. You can, of course, put like Jiffy DOS or Dolphin DOS or, I don't know, you name it. Uh, any kernel ROM that's available for the C64 should work absolutely no problems with this because it just, it's just accessed in the way that the original ROMs are accessed and uh, the C64 doesn't know the difference. So pretty nice. And you can of course combine these. So you can uh, set this to this CPC looking font, 
should be this, yeah, and we have the different font there. And otherwise, obviously, the C64 should work just as it is usually working, just with different character ROMs and different kernel ROMs. Cartridges, there's also some example cartridges on here, I think, some games and stuff. Uh, you have to close a jumper, which is laid out in the instructions. I'm just going to set this back to a normal C64 again. There we are, that's our normal, regular startup screen. The coupler PLA replacement seems to work flawlessly. I don't know if there's any piece of software that doesn't work with it. If anybody encounters software that doesn't work with the coupler, there is a programming header on here, the JTAG header that's just here next to it, that you can reprogram this little CPLD that the coupler is realized with, uh, with the newer version. So it's updatable in circuit or upgradable, really. That should be future-proof. <laughs> and these uh, CPLDs should be a lot more reliable than the original old-school programmable logic arrays. That's what PLA stands for, by the way. So, uh, yeah, this should be more reliable than any original C64 PLA and should last a long time. And then, obviously, there is the elephant in the room. I think this is the most prominent feature of this whole endeavor. The dual SID setup with two separate sockets that can be set to different SID revisions with these easily configurable jumpers. And there's also this little array of dip switches or jumpers depending on how you set this up, that you can set different modes for these SIDs. You can choose which SID is the one that is the first one that is recognized by the system. You can also choose different modes of operation. Uh, I have this set up to dual mono SID, basically. So both of these are reacting to the same signals. They are both active at the same time. And one of them is outputted on the left channel and one of them is outputted on the right channel. So we get a nice stereo effect because these are slightly differently sounding SIDs. The most beautiful addition to this is probably the preamp module. There are different versions of these available. So in the standard configuration you can have dual SIDs, set them up according to your taste. You can also run these jumpers out of the case and have like proper switches for modes and things. These can also be switched to react to different addresses, so this should be compatible with all dual SID software according to how you set this up, which is kind of an amazing feature and is better than most standalone dual SID setups at this point. So uh, this is easily reconfigurable to different needs. And also we have this beautiful thing. In the standard configuration without this preamp module, you can already set different preamp values for both these sets, so you can accommodate for differences in volume and things. There's potentiometers under this preamp board that I won't remove at this point because it is set up as it should and screwed down on the board, which is quite solid, so I'm not going to mess with that. But trust me, there are little uh, potentiometers that you can set according to your taste or to rectify volume differences between different SID models on the output. There are several options for getting the glorious dual SID sound out of this into your amplifier, your mixing desk, your DAW software whatever, you name it. If you have one of these preamp modules installed, and as I pointed out and several people have talked about, because it is kind of amazing, there is this new tube version of it, which I got, and there's also going to be a version of the preamp board with real valves, real tubes. There's the real tube preamp for the C64 available in the future. So that's going to be amazing. Probably even better sounding than this, although this is already amazing, as you're going to hear in a second. On these preamp modules, you have a little jack that you can plug in a stereo plug here. I had my little speakers directly hooked up to this and it worked flawlessly. You can also use the original output jack if you don't have a preamp mod module or if you prefer this output. 
There are jumpers on the back of the board. These are pretty tiny, but these are solder jumpers to set the sound output to different configurations. There are several standards for stereo SID output on these DIN sockets. You can set this up according to which cable or which adapter you use. So uh, just put a blob of solder there for your configuration. I've been using one of these, which is an adapter that has a DIN input and outputs regular connectors. So you have like these RCA jacks and this S video jack and you can jumper this to stereo, which should give you separate audio for left and right. And you can uh, configure this to output audio on the correct pin. I'm not sure which one you need for this adapter, but that's probably a matter of asking a search engine online. Yeah, you can basically set this up to have stereo output. In this configuration, it works just like any regular C64, so you only have one SID outputting on this AV jack there, the DIN socket, and just have mono audio. I'm going to primarily use the little phono jack here that provides me with the output from the new Tube 64 preamp. And as I mentioned on all the I.O. ports, there's little things to protect this from current surges. So there's ESD protection on all the outputs or inputs outputs, which should make this more reliable, even if you handle this a lot and accidentally touch the joystick ports. And obviously, uh, if you are familiar with the original C64 boards, there's a lot more filter capacitors on here. So the original C64 designs usually have three of these big filter capacitors and this one has them in parallel, I think six of them. So there's double filtering on the power rails. In this configuration, we have the linear voltage regulator and two separate linear voltage regulators for 9 volts and 12 volts that power all this, which is of course the cleanest way to power these chips because the switching regulators you can also use as replacements usually introduce a switching noise, which is mostly high frequency stuff, which doesn't affect the old chips as much, but uh, the cleanest way is linear regulators, obviously. And regarding power supplies, I used my self-made power supply that I made a video about a while back, which is a switching power supply for the DC part. The AC part is basically just a huge transformer directly hooked up to the AC outputs. But the DC part is a rather noisy switching power supply. And even that noisy power supply gave me some great output uh, regarding sound and video on the Evo. So the filtering on the board works well. It's not recommended to run this on a regular C64 power supply. The original power supplies are crap anyway, frankly. So you want a replacement power supply that has a bit of a higher output, especially if you are using one of the preamp modules. The tube module is going to require an even more powerful power supply. So uh, they are working on a dedicated power supply for that, which is going to include a toroidal transformer and lots of linear regulators, as far as I can tell from the pictures I've seen on social media. So that is going to be like an audiophile version of the C64 power supply. This is just a humble switching power supply, which already works well. Okay, enough talk. Let's capture the video and audio from the EVO and compare it against some regular C64 setups. I'm going to capture uh, the video using my regular streaming setup with a RetroTINK 2X for the picture, which doesn't post-process the picture as much as other upscalers, so you can see the quality of the video output. And as I said, I didn't spend a lot of time on setting that up correctly, but it's still going to look better than a regular C64 with a VIC-2 of this vintage. And I'm going to capture the audio using the little phono jack on the new tube preamp through my Scarlett 2i2 USB audio interface, which is something that many, many people who are uh, remotely interested in audio quality have. So that's, I think, a good comparison point to uh, 
get a feel for how this sounds. I'm going to run several demos and things. I don't want to run too many games because most of the music gets flagged on YouTube these days. So I'm going to go with demos and try to compare the sound of this thing with regular C64s. So we're going to use the output from the new tube on the Evo and we're going to compare it against regular C64s of both variations, 18580 SID C64, I'm going to use my Aldi model for that, and one 6581 classic SID model. I have this new tube output connected to my Mac here, running into my trusty Scarlett 2i2, as I mentioned, and the video output you're going to see is the capture from the Evo 64 through my RetroTing 2X, through my Elgato capturing card. I'm going to record the audio in 44.1 kilohertz, 16-bit CD quality audio, basically, and going to overlay that on the picture output. And I'm going to change between uh, the different C64 models and make a little display on the screen which SID configuration you're listening to currently. And I chose three different demos that I particularly like and already know how they are supposed to sound on a regular C64. So uh, it's easier for me to tell the difference, I guess. Hope you can tell the difference with my test setup here. The demos I chose are the Cauldron demo, the Wonderland 13 demo and Comoland. I'm going to put links to these demos in the video description so you can have a listen on your personal setup and I hope YouTube doesn't mess with the audio too much and you can still hear the differences. These are all demos for uh, a single SID setup, so no stereo SID going on there, but I'm still going to record both SIDs on the EVO 64 so you can hear the stereo SID setup with the different variants of the SID on uh, separate channels. So let's go!
Yeah, the SID is an amazing sound chip in its own right and the EVO takes it to a kind of a different level with the uh, preamp board on there. I hope you could hear some differences. Uh, there definitely are from where I am standing listening on my proper uh, studio monitor speakers here. And I think the new tube just adds a bit of granularity to the sound that is kind of subtle but it makes it so much blend together so much better like tube sounds generally do they add some overtones and make the whole thing sound a bit smoother so uh the new tube does a pretty nice job of that those examples we listened to were all meant to be used with a single sit so i had the evo set up in dual mono sit mode basically so both sits got the same signals there are some tunes that are made for separate sit setups and we're going to listen to some of those that you suggested on mastodon and also in my discord we're going to do this very briefly because this video probably is long enough already i mean i could definitely listen to sit music all day long but uh, you probably have something else to do let's listen to some tunes that are made for dual sits so we're going to listen to this in stereo one sit is going to be left one sit is going to be right both of them are all right <laughs> Basically the same setup as before, except for me changing the little jumper here to dual sit mode. And I'm recording this into the same Scarlett that I recorded into before, so you can hear the real sound of this. There's nothing going on graphically, I'm using the built-in sit player from the Ultimate and we're just going to take a listen, I guess.
Those were excerpts from two tunes actually made for a dual sit setup, so uh, both sits play different things most of the time. I think you probably agree that that was pretty amazing sounding. I don't want to bore you with more sound examples. I think at this point you should have a bit of an idea what the EVO 64 is and what it is about. Who is it for though? I guess sit musicians, chiptune artists are going to love this thing. I am not much of a musician myself, at least not in the chiptune field but I do love the sound of this a lot and I definitely see myself building kind of a C64 synthesizer out of this. I'm definitely going to put it in a Bradbin C64 case, maybe add some knobs uh, like the pedals and use the synth card software or some other music software on this, maybe add some MIDI to it and use it in my audio setup just as an audio machine. I can also see this being perfect for demonstration purposes on uh, demo parties and things for the demo scene. So the picture quality is excellent thanks to the clear video circuit and the sound quality as you've probably noticed is nice <laughs> to put it mildly. It's an amazing machine and it's, it's kind of a new perspective on some things that the C64 could do. So I'm not sure if this is for every C64 fan though, especially considering the price point. Reservations for this are open now, so you can go on the website evo64.com and reserve your Evo 64 board. These are going to come as uh, kits, so you get the board with all the uh, surface mount components already pre-soldered onto the board and you only have to put the through-hole components on there as well as obviously the MOS chips, the original custom chips that Commodore provided with the C64 or replacements for those. Those are not going to be included in any kit. There's also going to be the option to have the board pre-built so you get a readily built board for a bit more. Of course you can choose between the different preamp modules or no preamp module and there's several other things you can customize. Let's take a look at the website and see how much this thing is going to cost. So this is the EVO 64 website. It's coming soon, February 15th, 2023. I hope I get this video out the door before that. Uh, there's a huge link on the top here that says press here to reserve yours. And there's the prices. The main board with pre-soldered s and parts is 285 US dollars. The through hole parts are 55 US dollars. That includes all the through hole components, the connectors and things like that. There's also the option to have this pre-soldered 85 US dollars. The new tube audio preamp module is 500 US dollars. But that price I think is justified because the new tube modules themselves that uh, Korg makes are not cheap and also the preamp modules are hand aligned by Dr. Stefano who puts several hours into perfectly setting these up to have the perfect output. There's also going to be the triode 64 that I talked about earlier. That's the huge thing with the tubes, the actual valves, tubes, whatever you want to call them. Uh, that is going to cost 1000 US dollars and is not ready yet, as I've said. And you can also get these 5 volt step down converters that you can, I think, replace the linear regulators with for 25 US dollars each. Uh, these are pricey, especially the good ones, the low noise ones, so that is also a good price. Yeah, it is expensive but if you take into account how much work went into these designs and into building these and how much production of a board like this costs with the components already pre-soldered on there I think the price is kind of justified. It is not a run-of-the-mill Commodore 64 replica. There are many options you can use if you want that. This is kind of a specialized option uh, as I said for 
the best audio output you can possibly get out of the C64. Also some convenience features and uh, versatility added to this. I think the price is kind of justified. I'm not sure if I uh, would pay that much for a C64 because I already have a few and uh, yeah obviously I got the Evo 64 as a review model for free which I am super grateful for because I love it as I said. It's just a bit pricey for my budget here but there are probably going to be people readily willing to pay that for a nicely made project like this. Yeah, I think I covered about everything I wanted to talk about in this video. There is probably going to be another episode where I turn this into kind of a music machine and put it in a case and put proper heat sinks on the chips and things like that. No other future proofing, recapping things are necessary because this is a new board, but the old custom chips definitely deserve some cooling. They still run pretty hot. Uh, even in a modern board, obviously. Yeah, let me know in the comments what you think about the EVO 64 and if you consider getting one or if you maybe consider getting another replica board. The Reloaded, as I said, comes pre pretty close to this minus the extra features. It has some other extra features. It also supports dual sit setups. This one is kind of special in that it has these preamp modules. You could of course work around that by just adding an external preamp like a studio uh, 19 inch rack thing or something like that, which are probably even higher quality, but they also cost just as much as these preamp modules that you can just plug into the boards. So I think that's it for today. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and also on Ko-fi. Hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye. <laughs>